Welcome to a conversation on international affairs. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is William Rusher, a distinguished figure in the conservative movement in the United States. Mr. Rusher has been a television personality uh, on the program The Advocates. He is a syndicated columnist. He's the author of numerous books on conservatism and the conservative movement in the United States. And uh, he is recognized <coughs> as a key figure in articulating the conservative agenda and implementing it uh, through the support of leading conservative political figures. And of course, he was the publisher of the National Review. Mr. 31 Russell, years. <laughs> welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. Where were you educated? Uh, in the public schools of New York primarily and uh, Great Neck High School in New York. <clears throat> and then I went to Princeton uh, just as the war was breaking out there, managed to get, uh, by a hurry-up process, get my degree before going off to serve, and then after the war went to Harvard Law School and practiced law for nine years before turning to a life of crime and becoming a magazine publisher. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. And uh, what, did your education make you a conservative? What, what, what helped shape you? No, it was nothing that dramatic. My uh, father and mother were Republicans of no great uh, 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 special distinction, just that was the way they felt. Uh, my father's father had been a socialist all his life. Charles Rusher was a uh, coal miner in western Indiana and a supporter of Eugene Debs, who came from hmm. Terre Haute. But my father went into business, became a Republican, and my mother was a Republican. And it so happened that Alf Landon, who was the Republican candidate in 1936, came from my mother's hometown, Independence, in southeastern Kansas. Not Independence, Missouri, Independence, Kansas. And when I found that out, age 13, you know who I was for. And mm -hmm. when he lost so heavily, I think that gave me the the impulse to get into politics and correct this ghastly error that the American people had made. <laughs> Were you, you, but, but you really began as a moderate Republican when, yes, when, you, when yes. you were young adults. Yes, when adult. I uh, was in college, uh, I wrote my thesis on the progressive element in the Republican Party mm -hmm. and dedicated it to Wendell Wilkie. I was a big Wilkie man. I think my feeling was not so much that uh, I preferred one wing of the party over the other, as that I deeply preferred to have the party in office, and the only way I thought it could get there was by being a moderate party, which mm -hmm. I think was true at that time. Um, but uh, after the war, when the Cold War broke out, uh, I became a staunch Cold Warrior, and uh, I watched with fascination and sympathy the investigations of the House Committee on American Activities and the Chamber's Hiss controversy. So I was moving to the right, I would say, from that time forward, the late 1940s. I, I got the sense from your book that, <clears throat> that the, the, the issue of anti-communism was really key uh, during the, the Eisenhower period in, in pushing you uh, further That's into correct. the conservative movement. There were, the conservative movement really got started in the early 1950s, and it had three components, the libertarians and the, the Austrian school of economics around von Mises and Hayek. That was one. Then there was the Burkean traditionalists, uh, descended intellectually from Russell Kirk in this country. And while I read uh, The Road to Serfdom and, and read uh, Kirk's books, um, my own, as you're quite right, my own introduction to the general subject was from the anti-communist sphere. And, that, and what might be called an operational anti-communism was the third main tributary of the conservative movement. The people who not only were uh, opposed to the Soviet Union, but took the whole controversy seriously on a philosophical level and uh, believed that the party represented a problem domestically as well as internationally. But let's talk a, a minute about these uh, three strands mm -hmm. and, and why you, you the, the libertarian strand first. Why, why do you think it, it resonated or did it resonate with the American political culture? Well, it uh, resonated with a part of it, no mm. question about that. Hayek's book uh, got uh, well noticed. It certainly was not uh, in the mainstream at the time. Mm. It was resolutely swimming against the current and knew it. Um, and what, do you, what was, state for us, the, the major tenant there that was most important? Well, for the, uh, the uh, Hayek and, and uh, in, in general opposed the proposition that government planning was the way to construct an economy and with it a society. Uh, he did not believe in that. He thought that it uh, led to all the wrong results. In a very short but very cogently and tersely argued book, he, 
he demonstrated that. I remember one chapter was, Why the Worst Get on Top? And he just plain <laughs> explained why uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that was the case. The traditionalists, they, incidentally, the libertarians and the traditionalists had not all that much in common. They, they disagreed with each other on a great many things. The traditionalists, uh, as the name implies, uh, uh, took as their intellectual father Edmund Burke and believed in the value of established tradition and order in a society. Uh, they, their, their roots tended to be Catholic and continental and hierarchical, whereas the the um, uh, libertarians were individualist and uh, perhaps uh, around the Atlantic Rim a bit more. So uh, there, there were real dis disagreements. Interestingly enough, when Young Americans for Freedom came along in the 1960s, they immediately split up into two blocks, the trads and the libs. <laughs> I would go to speak at one of their conventions and they, the caucus for the trads would be over there and the caucus mm -hmm. for the libs would be over here. Now, what, what about the anti-communist strain? That, the, the, uh, these other two were really uh, imported from abroad. Would that be fair to say? I think or, that's yeah, true. Yeah, they, right. were in, they were really uh, separate responses to the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. Yes, the intellectual development. But, but, but the, the anti-communist component was really indigenous? Would, would, would that be a fair statement or not? Uh, no. Well, at least a great many of the, of the most noted anti-communists well, 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 were European yeah, immigrants, Eastern, East yeah, European right, 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 refugees okay. of one sort or another, although many of them also were American. Uh, and many, if not most, were former communists themselves. Mm -hmm. Whitaker Chambers, Frank Meyer, James Burnham, although he was never a communist, was a Trotskyist, and a, mm -hmm. a very prominent one. So uh, uh, the anti-communists came along much later intellectually because they were a response to the communist revolution and the communist world enterprise as they saw it. And uh, they believed that it had to be taken seriously and fought a outrance with everything. And you, you said uh, you were attracted by an operational anti-communism. Well, I tried. And I, 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 <clears throat> that refers to the fact that you actually served as a Senate investigator. I, 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 well, I, uh, that's not why I use the word operational. Yeah. I, I was reaching for something to, to qualify the concept of anti-communism as rather more than just ordinary anti-communism. Mm -hmm. In other words, we took it as a, as a specialty. And mm -hmm. you're quite right. In my case, I became fascinated by the Communist Party and did uh, and and talked to got to know many ex-communists and uh, became a good friend of Robert Morris who was chief counsel to the internal security subcommittee and eventually asked me to be his associate counsel so I did get into it operationally in the quite literal sense of the word but yes uh, uh, I, I did become uh, active in that sense too in the in the uh, Battle. And, and Eisenhower was a disappointment for you with, with, with regard to his, his dealing with that, that issue, right? With regard to a great many things, including mm -hmm. that issue. Eisenhower, uh, I was very much for him. I was for Eisenhower and therefore against Taft in the Battle of 1952 for the Republican nomination. But I was deeply disappointed in the kind of, um, one would have to almost say do nothing presidency, the preside mm -hmm. over it but don't touch it, the kind of presidency. They called the White House in those days the tomb of the well-known soldier. <laughs> <laughs> now, but, but that, uh, our, our historians now and political scientists are taking a different view of Eisenhower. Do you still hold that to, to, to your analysis which you just offered? Well, I think it's true that Eisenhower was a craftier man than he was depicted as being at the mm -hmm. time. The liberals, with their domination of the media, immediately moved in to depict him as a fool. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I suppose even the conservative critics of Eisenhower saw nothing wrong with going along with that idea. I don't think he was a fool. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't think that he uh, had any deep understanding of where America could be led or should be led. Uh, I think he was a, um, an attempt by the Republicans to hold the office without doing much with it. Now. About the time that we're, we're now talking about, the 50s, uh, National Review uh, came into being. Right. Tell us a little about uh, uh, the background of that, that happening. Well, there was a prior publication, a sort of a John the Baptist among conservative publications called The Freeman, which started, I think, in 1951 and which had a great many of the writers and personalities in it that later did come to National Review. Buckley not among them. He was uh, just in and out of college at that time down in Mexico for a while, working in the CIA, mm -hmm. by the way. 
But uh, the Freeman broke up after 1952 over the issue of Eisenhower versus Taft. It had a great many cooks uh, uh, making the broth over there, and uh, it broke up. And uh, so Willy Schlamm, who was one of the people in the breakup, uh, came to Buckley and said, we need a new conservative journal of opinion. And the, the single greatest contribution Schlamm ever made to it, he said, it sh all the voting stock should be in one person's hand, preferably yours. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and to make a long story short, the magazine was launched in November 1955. Buckley was both editor and publisher, but he very quickly found that it was too much of a load, and he, I was about to step down as, as associate counsel to the Internal Security Subcommittee. And when he invited me to leave the practice of the law and become publisher of National Review, I found it too tempting to resist and, and lived happily ever after. And, and what, what is uh, <clears throat> the importance uh, of National Review for the conservative movement? How, how well, as I described to you, it began with three separate uh, contending and, and often disagreeing tributaries to this single stream. Mm -hmm. Somebody, to change the metaphor, had to make the lions and the bears and the tigers all lie down together. <laughs> and uh, I'll have to say for William Buckley that he proved a, a giant diplomat in that regard. He created, out of these disparate <coughs> tendencies, the modern conservative movement, gave it its name, and then by virtue of his personality, sort of put it on the map in terms of television, made people think, well, gosh, if a fellow this clever can can be for it, maybe there's something to be said for it, uh, worked out a great many of its formulations, refereed all its internal feuds, which were ghastly, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the fact, no question about it, that he had all the voting stocks solved a lot of problems. <laughs> even, even if I disagreed it's with him. The importance of capitalism, I yeah, think. I, uh, well, you see, if I disagreed with him, uh, I, I could give way peacefully, knowing that it was merely because he had the voting stock, not because he was right. I never conceived he was right on anything, <laughs> I <see. laughs> if, if I disagreed with him. Now, I, I noticed in the introduction uh, to one of your books, you, you emphasize that, that philosophically you feel that ideas really have to come first. Well, they did in this case, mm -hmm. no question about it. In the beginning was the word. We didn't have, oh, there were some conservative senators. Taft had died in 1953. Stiles Bridges was still around. William Nolan was minority leader. But there was nothing uh, you could build on seriously and until the conservative movement began to look like something you could refer to and apply the principles of to the determination of issues. And uh, it was just as clear as, to me as can be that the period from 1955 when Nashville was launched until 1960 was the period of creating the intellectual movement. But by 1960, it had done everything it could do simply as an intellectual movement. And something had to bring it into politics. And most of the people who were in it had no gift for politics. Mm -hmm. They were professors or ex-communists of one sort or another with little marginal jobs. And uh, uh, where were the politicians? Well, the Lord provides. At that point, uh, a whole group of bright young men started the Conservative Party of New York. Uh, another group launched what turned into the draft Goldwater uh, movement. Certain politicians like Goldwater and indeed Nolan and Jenner and others uh, were willing to identify with us and encourage us and speak for us to some extent. And as we know, Goldwater eventually got the nomination. And, and, and as I say in the book, uh, far from being the great tragedy which in, uh, that you, you might think by uh, Goldwater's defeat by Johnson, it was. 64 was a almost indispensably seminal year. Mm -hmm. That was the year we got control of the Republican Party. It was the year that we established the mailing lists. Uh, they had to be cr created and, and filed with various clerks of Congress and so on. And, and Goldwater got more small contributions than any presidential candidate up that time had ever received. So here we were suddenly with mailing lists that could be computerized mm -hmm. and, and used in senatorial campaigns in the future money raising of all sorts, and then last but far from least, a certain actor slightly over the hill uh, made a speech for Goldwater, and the next thing you know, he was governor of California by a million votes. <laughs> and, and, and thus the movement again. What, what, what were the social dynamics, do you think, in the country that, that entered into this, this uh, Very wave? good question, and I, I think a, a very clear answer to it. Uh, the conservative movement as of 1960, certainly was in a position to make a case to the country for less government and uh, for a solid resistance to the communists 
and perhaps for an honoring of tradition, but that would not in itself have necessarily changed a lot. What happened at that time was that the whole uh, cultural counter-revolution came along, the sexual revolution, the uprise in drugs, the flood of pornography, the uh, uh, increase in the Vietnam War, uh, eventually toward the end of the decade particularly. So the new left was on the scene. Now the new left tends to think of the 1960s as their decade, and perhaps it was, but I also happen to think that the conservatives got 100,000 votes per riot straight through the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And you can see the, the transformation, a whole group of blue-collar, formerly democratic or independent voters swung away from their democratic affiliation. They stopped worrying so much about economics and began worrying more about what was happening to their country, what was happening to the family values. And they're still worried about that. And they became a new part of this coalition. And I might add a big voting chunk of this coalition. Mm -hmm. uh, still later, or no, about that same time, the neoconservatives, a small but very influential group of New York intellectual liberals, uh, moved over again in resistance to the new left. In the late 1970s, the religious right signed aboard again with a large number of new voters so that the movement got larger numerically. But to answer your question, the social dynamic was when the swing vote, I would put it at 20% of the American electorate, shifted in about 1965 or 6 uh, or 7 from the Democrats to either to an independent candidacy like Wallace or into a Republican coalition. If uh, Nixon had not fallen as a, as a result of Watergate, do you think he would have uh, been able to co-opt the sting of the movement or, or would you consider him to have been a true conservative? No, he, I, I never considered him a true conservative and he was very late in understanding the, the depth or importance of the conservative mm -hmm. movement. Uh, but he does say in his memoirs, written about 1976, that he intended in his second term to turn the Republican Party into the party of the new majority. He mm -hmm. now retrospectively begins seeing how important it was, and I don't know how truly, identifies himself as having had that intention. Mm -hmm. As we know, he never got the chance to act on it if he had it, because he got booted by Watergate instead. But uh, he did, he, he wasn't just, uh, I, I agree with you that up until then he had been co-opting and very successfully diminishing the impact of the conservative movement. I was furious with him. I didn't even vote for him in 1972. didn't vote for anybody, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for president. But uh, um, I'm, it may be that he finally got the word there and realized because uh, there's a, he, he says it several times, I intended to turn the new Republican Party along new majority line. Uh, what about the, the development in the late 70s of uh, think tanks uh, such as the Heritage uh, Foundation? That is where we were now moving to a, a, a real development of a conservative program uh, with a, a, an agenda with the particulars. Did, was that yes. also a, a new thrust here in this Yes, period? it was. Uh, the sequence was first the word, the 55 to 60, <laughs> then the turn to politics from 60 roughly to mm -hmm. 70, and then in the, not just the late 70s, even in the early mm -hmm. 70s, the Heritage Foundation began about 1973, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, that early? Yeah. Um, yes, the 70s, uh, the, the thing proliferated Unbelievably, I, when I wrote my book, and, uh, which was supposed to be a history of this whole thing, and got to the period of the 70s, it mm -hmm. just got out of hand. I knew I could not mm -hmm. do justice to all the things that were happening. I almost totally forgot about Phyllis Schlafly and had to put in a last minute uh, paragraph on the subject of her impact on the women's movement, which mm -hmm. was enormous, of course. Mm -hmm. All of which happened in the 70s. That was, I would say, in retrospect, we, we didn't see it coming, but a lot of people were getting interested in conservatism by then, and they would pick out their particular topic and concentrate on that. We had committees and still have on everything, every conceivable subject, legal foundations, testing things in the courts, campaign schools to train managers and candidates, uh, uh, journalistic schools to train young conservative journalists, uh, uh, separate committees on Africa, on Asia, on Latin America, on tax limitation, uh, everybody doing his thing and it all proliferated during the 1970s. I think it was the function of the larger number of people involved. 
And then President Reagan uh, emerges, of course, over the 70s, but, but uh, his, his candidacy, I guess, becomes most serious uh, uh, at the end of the decade. What, what did he bring uh, uh, to this effort as a, now, as a political leader? I think of Nixon as a sad detour. Uh, <laughs> Reagan uh, was elected governor of California in 1966. He was kind of sensitive about, therefore, running for president in 68. He wasn't sure people would feel he had been blooded enough. Mm -hmm. But I wanted him to run, and eventually he did try hard in 68 and almost defeated Nixon for the nomination then. Then he tried again in 76, and as we know, was very narrowly defeated by Ford for the nomination, uh, who then proceeded to lose the election. So Reagan was delayed, but Reagan was the man who took a movement that had everything else. By that time, even money, which was the last thing to arrive. Mm -hmm and uh, gave it that, that keystone of the arch, the, the, the national spokesman, a man perfectly capable of communicating superbly with the American people who believed deeply in the movement. I, I was sometime believing even that he was a truly movement conservative. I came to know him and to know that he is. He really cared for the movement. He had been a subscriber to National Review since 1960, in fact, a very, mm -hmm. very faithful one. So. Um, he, one has to say that uh, the movement obviously would have amounted to something in any case, but the Lord just provided Ronald Reagan. And, uh, and, and, and what were his, his media <coughs> skills that, that he had developed as a, as, as a movie star and in Hollywood? I mean, w w was that a key element? What, Very what, much. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bill Buckley is a wonderful uh, speaker and fascinates people, but he has this rather arch uh, English style about him. Eastern establishment. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Reagan uh, comes across uh, quintessentially as a perfect way of putting things. He's a great ear for mm -hmm. the right way to put a thing. His speechwriters have told me that he will often change things that they wrote down and invariably mm -hmm. for the better in that regard to make them simpler, make them more intelligible, mm -hmm. make them more colorful. And uh, then it doesn't hurt either to be a man who never treads on his own lines the way George Bush does. Bush is often halfway into the next sentence before the applause starts for the last sentence, you know. And then he's in a terrible tangle. Mm -hmm. Reagan knows just where to stop and how long to wait and then to tell the next little wisecrack and let the penny drop at exactly the right moment. And you know, These are skills that you get as an actor, no question about it. Uh, did, did, do, do you think that Reagan, once he came in, was more pragmatic than you would have expected? Was he something, was he ever a disappointment in the early years? And if he was, was he responsible or the people around him? He wasn't a disappointment to me. I, you have must distinguish here. I know plenty of conservatives who were deeply disappointed mm -hmm. in him. I don't think most by a long shot, but there I, I know individual uh, uh, conservatives for whom Reagan was just uh, no good at all. Uh, I didn't feel that way. I felt that um, I understood the difference between a theoretical position I could occupy or saying something on this program and running for and becoming and serving as President of the United States. It's a tremendously different thing. If he m made a slip of the tongue, some ministry could fall in mm -hmm. Asia or something like that. <laughs> and he just had to be terribly careful. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I think it turned out to be a tougher job even than he had realized. Uh, but he certainly tried at it to the very last. I think he accomplished a great deal. Uh, more than I can think of any other president assuming he had an agenda, achieving his agenda. Uh, and as I said, I think he was a true believer. I think he did it because, as Peggy Noonan says in her book, he really, he really believed in it. What, what do you think was his greatest achievement? Well, you'd have to choose among several. Um, Cutting the income tax rate is terribly important. We see even today that the Democrats are strategically crippled by their inability or unwillingness to raise those income tax rates. If you haven't got the poker chips, you can't play the game, you mm -hmm. see. So in a sense, that was a tremendously important achievement. Uh, uh, then again, uh, as we see now, uh, I think unquestionably his buildup of the American defenses and the threat of SDI, which left the Russians realizing that if it was carried out, their 
their huge missiles would be worthless and they would have to spend more than they had spent on them to get an SDI mm -hmm. of their own. It sort of broke their hearts a little bit. Uh, uh, and, and thirdly, you could, you could, uh, you could say that, uh, and there, I think there's something to be said for it, that almost his, his biggest achievement was a kind of a moral achievement. He, he, he made America after Vietnam and after Watergate and after Carter's talk about malaise, feel a little bit proud of itself again. And that's a lot to do for a country. Let's, let's go through these points. I, I want to look at the first point. What, what do you say to a, a, a liberal or a, an opponent of conservatism who says, yes, but let's look at those deficits. I mean, uh, he, 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 he paid a very heavy price that, that we, in part, will have to pay for, but most especially our, our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Well, I'll tell you about our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I'm delighted to have the liberals as worried as they are these days about the, their great-grandchildren paying the price of this deficit. But do remember that what we pay is not the deficit, the principal. We pay the interest. That's mm -hmm. the main. And the interest is a very big item, the second largest in the budget now. Mm -hmm. no, I'm not going to defend the nor is Reagan. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, whom I talk to and whose views I know are going to defend the deficit. But you must remember that every president uh, is confronted with options. And it's a trade-off. He either was going to rebuild the defenses of the United States or he was going to have a low deficit and a balanced budget. He either was going to cut the taxes and let the economy get on the roll it's been on ever since or he was going to, to have that deficit. He opted for the deficit and uh, when one talks about its long-term deleterious aspects, the one that hurts most is the servicing of the debt, the interest on the debt. Uh, but if you look at the debt, or even the servicing on it, as a percentage of gross national product, you will find that this country has kept on growing and that uh, the deficit, certainly the debt, uh, the, the actual annual deficits, are diminishing as a percentage of gross national product, as, as well as absolutely under the Graham-Rudman guidelines. So uh, I think, frankly, that it's a little comical to me. I've been around long enough to remember the Democrats uh, back when they could have cared less about deficits, and uh, I'm delighted to have them worry about them, but I think they're worried mostly because they've got so little else to worry about. <laughs> What, what about the, the social conditions that uh, we're now uh, having to confront? I mean, there, mm -hmm. there are any uh, uh, number of problems, the problems of the homeless, uh, 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 problems of, of things like uh, our capacity to provide <coughs> daycare. I mean, there's a whole agenda, which, which obviously is not your agenda. What I'm curious about is some parts of that agenda uh, really do harken back to a conservative tradition in the sense of, of taking care of the whole uh, of the community and so on. I, is there any connection there be, between the two, that is the needs that, that we're experiencing and the responsibilities uh, that even uh, uh, the traditional conservatives involve? No question for? That, that we have a, a serious, to take your homeless, which is probably the, the paradigmatic problem. That's a serious problem, and it's just as serious for conservatives as it is for liberals, and we have just as many ideas or maybe more about what to do about them. But let's first of all understand, I, it's a little disingenuous of the liberals to say, when I look at all the homeless that suddenly appeared during the Reagan administration all over the streets, uh, the homeless are a product of several things that have been happening over decades in the American society. We always had a... a uh, marginal group of alcoholics out on the streets in the Bowery in New York and so on. Bums, we call them, hobos, whatnot. Uh, but uh, beyond that, when the drug culture came in, no question that uh, this increased that problem enormously, as well as the crime problem. And uh, then certain therapeutic drugs became available and it became one of the great ambitions of, among others, the American Civil Liberties Union to deinstitutionalize the mentally ill. They thought they were doing them a favor. So now we have all those people out on the street talking to imaginary people on the sidewalk and one way or another. And all of this uh, is, is called Reagan's callous contribution to the problem of the homeless, which just is not. Now, what do you do about this? Well, you, you, you do not simply provide 
nice little ranch style houses for all mm -hmm. these people. Uh, you could put them all up in the Trump Tower and it would be a crack then in about a week. Uh, you know that. There's the, we, uh, there are various things. Uh, one, one man who spent a, a lot of time in private efforts to help on this told me that one of the problems is the disintegration of the family. He said it used to be that a great many of these people, alcoholics, drug addicts, mental, mm -hmm. uh, mentally ill, would be taken care of in one way or another by their families, but there's no family to take care of them now mm -hmm. in that sense. So that, uh, again, that has, has happened. You're going to have to, well, the drug, the drug, let's just take that. The drug uh, problem, I happen to think, is, is a problem of uh, eliminating or reducing the demand. I don't see that the supply is anything but a function of the demand. They'll get through if the demand is here. Um, but the demand in turn, uh, well, I think we are having some effect. I don't think that Bennett's program is altogether without effect. If the statistics we hear about the decline in the use of marijuana in high schools is true, and so we're getting maybe somewhere in that regard. Um, the but, but does government, I mean, I hear you saying that, that go, does government have a responsibility oh, yeah. here? Well, but you're saying it's only external to go after the, the source, really, to find no, the place. I, well, government has a responsibility to do what government can do to make things better. That doesn't mean that throwing money at problems or creating a czar for some problem is automatically the best way to handle it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that is the case in many of these situations. In the particular, cases of, in the particular case of drugs, uh, unless you go for decriminalization, which is Bill Buckley's solution, but not mine, um, I think you have to say that one government function is certainly to uh, attack as best we can the whole question of the uh, demand. But I'm interested to see that here in California, uh, the state has launched a $27 million advertising campaign to badmouth tobacco. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what would happen if anybody tried to spend that amount of money on a campaign against drugs in California, do you suppose? I have a hunch Willie Brown would not let that through the legislature. He wouldn't and have why much not? trouble. Why not? I mean, why? Because this is the fashionable mm. vice. Tobacco is the middle class uh, disease. Uh, but a little uh, pot, a little crack, uh, these are things that uh, younger and different uh, social categories have found out and, and, and go for. And uh, they are, for the moment, untouchable, I think. What about the, the social responsibility, though, in, 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 in the traditional conservatism? Is, is, does that, does that uh, uh, tradition find its outlet in the, in the notion of voluntarism? I mean, in yes, other words, it, it, uh, that would be the primary place to look. No, I think there is a, a, an important critique being made. Uh, you take uh, all the books of Charles Murray, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, are, are brilliant analyses of what's wrong with, with, with the liberal solutions to the welfare problem. But take Aid to Families with Dependent Children, which is a well-intentioned program, uh, started by the liberals with a view to, to helping mostly, although not exclusively, black families. But the way it's set up, the only people who can benefit under it are, are women without uh, husbands, basically, so that if there is a man in the picture, the first thing he's got to do is get out of sight or leave his home uh, in order to qualify his woman for the money. In other words, this became the great subsidy of the destruction of the black two-parent family in America. And the result is we've got 61% single-parent uh, uh, families in black America. Now, this is a tragedy. And uh, if the conservatives do nothing except try to put a stop to that, they are, are making a big step in the right direction. As Kemp has said, Jack Kemp, if you, if you subsidize something, you get more of it. If you tax it, you get less of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. let's, let's talk a little about uh, foreign policy and, and Reagan's contribution there. Mm -hmm. uh, you made the argument that, that he, he won the Cold War uh, well, it's a little simplistic. Yeah. I, don't want to, I don't want to make a sweeping statement like that. I think that one of his great contributions, let's put it this way, I don't think that, that the Soviet Union would have been quite so ready to pack it in mm -hmm. if Michael Dukakis or Jimmy Carter had been presiding over the decade mm -hmm. of the 80s. So, so that it, it wasn't really inevitable. I mean, <coughs> we had to have the buildup, really. 
uh, to oh, achieve the result. inevitable. Uh, I, I happen to think the Cold War at various points was a very near thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the sense that the outcome could have gone either absolutely, way. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, in recent years, I think, the Soviet Union, by which I mean the last uh, six to eight years, the Soviet Union has economically gone into a tailspin, mm -hmm. which was probably inevitable, but in any case has happened now. But uh, I think that uh, facing Reagan, Thatcher, and Cole has not mm -hmm. done their morale any good. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, so but, but uh, from your perspective, the Cold War is over? I think so. I am, I, uh, I don't want to be a Pollyanna, and I'm certainly mm -hmm. not about to dash out and spend some peace dividend I'm not sure is there. But uh, I am not one of these conspiratorial conservatives who think it's all a plot to uh, get our technology, no. And, and when, when do you think, you know, we had the proof, the evidence? Uh, Reagan uh, seemed to see the evidence in his last year uh, in office. Uh, do you think he, he was pre prescient in that sense? Yeah, well, he had better information. He said to me in, I think, about 1985 or 6, when I was in the Oval Office preparing an interview, and we were sitting as you and I are, and they mm. were fiddling around with the cameras and the lights mm. and one thing or another. We were waiting to get going, and we were talking, and he said, speaking of the Soviet Union, he said their economy is a basket case. Mm -hmm. Now, he turned out to be right on target there. Mm. Well, he had an awful lot of information the rest of us didn't have, I suppose, but he at least had the ability to know important information when it passed under his nose, and he singled out that as the... When, what, what was the, the convincing, uh, uh, event for you that, that... I think the Berlin Wall mm -hmm. it was the great obvious thing, uh, a, a symbol. It, it was not when it actually happened. A friend of mine uh, told me about a book he once read by an American colonel, Air Force colonel, on the, the psychology of individual dogfights in battle and mm -hmm. the point at which one of the two fighters wins is not necessarily when you think it is. It's when the other becomes convinced that he's going to lose. You see. Mm -hmm. At that point, the air goes out of him. And at some point further back, Gorbachev and company reached that conclusion. We don't know when. It may have been when they found out that Japan was about to exceed them in gross national product. Mm -hmm. That's right. And some, some people have said uh, that I, when they discovered they couldn't make a Hyundai, yeah, uh, yeah. Is another possibility. Do do is this conclusion universal within the conservative movement? Uh, uh, Not quite. Yeah, I, there are a few holdouts, although they're getting quieter and fewer. Mm -hmm. uh, and and what what is the basis of their position? Uh, do you feel suspicion? I mean, they suspicion. Just, they just don't trust communists, and if well, some communist grips his side and says, help, I am slain, mm -hmm. they, they are very careful about dashing up to help. <laughs> mm -hmm. were, were East European emigres, you, you mentioned this earlier, and, and uh, were really important to, to helping the conservatives focus yes. on anti-communism as a problem, so that, so that in fact this would become, uh, 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 help us understand better the, 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 the acceptance in some way. That, that, I mean, Eastern Europe was really a key element in, in alerting us to the threat. What happened to I Eastern Europe so. yeah, in oh, the late yes. Well, the uh, happened when? In uh, uh, I mean, uh, in, in alerting us to the threat in the 40s, basically. What the, the fate of Eastern Europe was critical. Well, I think, I think the Cold War began when Harry Truman decided he couldn't take what Stalin was doing with Eastern mm -hmm. Europe. You're right, 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 yeah, and right, Poland right. In particular. Uh, what should our policy be now to the Soviet Union? Do, do we want it to break apart? Do we, do we want it to, to push it completely against the wall? Or do we have any kind of interest the other way now? I suppose that if we had our druthers, the perfect thing would be for Gorbachev and those around him to decide that what they wanted was a democratic society with a market economy and to make a few little adjustments and bring around the Soviet Union to that situation. Unfortunately, I don't think that can be done. I wish devoutly it could be. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm afraid that a society as profoundly dirigiste as the Soviet one, with all the uh, psychological pressures of 70 years against anybody who, who makes anything of himself or shows the slightest ambition or makes a profit, which is an evil word to them, 
Uh, I'm afraid that that makes it impossible. I'm afraid that uh, we're going to have to see something very much like a total collapse and almost raising of the ground, followed by the slow buildup of a new society. So I don't, it isn't a question of what I want Gorbachev to do or to succeed. I don't think he has much of a chance. What should our position be toward the, the various uh, nationality groups that seek autonomy? We're, we're obviously uh, confronting the, the crisis in, in Lithuania. In general, we, we favor self-determination of peoples, uh, and uh, that cuts against the Soviet state as it currently exists. I don't think the Soviet state's very long for this world. I think uh, most uh, uh, somebody said that all of the component republics, including the Russian Republic, want to secede from it. <laughs> and I think they will gradually over a period of time. Do you, do you think that, that, that we should in any way support gradualism uh, on the part of these movements, or, or morally well, would it be? I think we are supporting gradualism. Well, do you think that's a good idea? Um, that's got to be a judgment call in each case. Mm -hmm. I think that Lithuania coming first, um, Gorbachev feels that he has to make some kind of a demonstration there in favor of gradualism or the whole ball game will be over before he can get back to the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, uh, and probably I, I would be rather sympathetic to letting him insist upon gradualism, uh, although it is perfectly true that, morally speaking, there's no, no case to be made for gradualism. What is it your view of, of, of his leadership? Do you, do you, uh, are you impressed by what he's achieved and the way he's gone about doing it? I'm impressed, but I'm also puzzled. I, uh, one has to ask, why is he doing it? Is he the designated hitter of a, of a group? Is he a sole operator who's doing this on his own? If he is, what is he doing? What, uh, does he have a plan, or is he as we now historians tend to think Franklin Roosevelt was rather an improviser, mm -hmm. who just sort of endorsed anything that came along and looked like it might work, you know. <laughs> um, uh, undoubtedly, what history thinks about Gorbachev is, is largely going to be a function of how he turns out, either well or badly, a fool or, or, or genius. But, uh, and, and most of his accomplishments, whether he likes it or not, are negative. He has been an enormous destructive force on the Soviet Union. He has disassembled it brick by brick. And he's done it from the inside, looking out. Somebody has said, and I, while there's their troubles with the analogy, it's not altogether unlike some pope uh, suddenly losing his faith and going around and telling everybody <laughs> that there's nothing to all mm. this, you know. So uh, it, it, do you think our support, and, and that is undefined, but I mean, it, it is important for his survival? Uh, uh, I don't think we really have that much to do with his survival mm -hmm. as a political proposition. Uh, he seems to be a pretty much of a survivor, but uh, it's quite possible that there are forces in the society that can bring him down. I don't think just the announcement of an American loan or something like that's going <coughs> to save his mm -hmm. bacon. Uh, I want to get back to the, the, the philosophical underpinnings of the movement because both in your biography and in your analysis of the conservative movement, anti-communism was a critical pillar. That's where I came from. Right. Remember, but, it, but historically, I think one can say that, that, that both anti-communism and the Soviet threat at, at key moments in the history of the movement were, were important. To well, they us. certainly were important and very important. But on the other hand, I am in this sense a convert to the conservative movement, that mm -hmm. I came to it from anti-communism, but I paid attention to what Kirk was saying about traditionalism and what right. Meyer was saying about libertarianism mm -hmm. and about fusionism, the, the bringing of the two together and, uh, and of the importance of uh, the coalition. So that I became, I think, a pretty well annealed conservative all along the line. And, uh, and anti-communism is just one aspect of that. Because my question is what happens when that uh, issue mm -hmm. passes from the scene. Hopefully it is. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, the Cold War is over, you know, uh, the adversary is defeated, and, and in fact, uh, one of uh, Gorbachev's advisors said, we will deny you your enemy, namely, yes. you know. What happens to the movement? Well, to begin with, as we, I guess we've already established, it's a complex movement that contains many conceivably even inconsistent parts. 
so that the impact of the end of the Cold War on them is going to differ. I can't see why the religious right, to take just one example out of half a dozen, should suddenly lose whatever connection it has with the conservative movement merely because the Cold War is over. Mm -hmm. And they've got millions of votes. I can't see why the libertarians, uh, unless they go way off to the end and then support the Libertarian Party, but then what might be called the sensible libertarian should, should suddenly, just because the Cold War is over, stop supporting the conservative mm -hmm. movement. On the other hand, um, I can imagine that uh, it would be an interesting question to what extent neoconservatives, of course they, they came in mostly in reaction to the new left, not to uh, the Cold War, although they are pretty strong. Some, some did. War. I mean, yes. some in response to the Cold War. Yeah. Some, yeah. Uh, they might be influenced to some extent. My own feeling is that basically the conservative coalition is a coalition not against communism so much as against liberalism. Mm -hmm. And that as long as liberalism is around, even in its present debilitated state, uh, it will provide uh, the glue to hold the coalition together. I think... Uh, um, if liberalism were to disappear in any serious way, as it may mm -hmm. eventually just sort of wither away, then uh, obviously you'd be facing a new state of affairs and some of these old fights, like, like the, uh, the, the lowering of the lake of communism in Eastern Europe has left, raised the old rocks of Germany mm -hmm. and other things which were there all the time but were hidden. Mm -hmm. The differences then between libertarians and traditionalists might start breaking out. Mm -hmm. I, I can see that off in the distance. Do, does the conservative movement have a new foreign policy agenda that, that <laughs> we might touch on or, or, or is I that not still unfocused yet? flapping around like everybody else <laughs> <laughs> the That's right. uh, we, uh, we, we We like to think that we are are, uh, uh, that the principles of conservatism can be applied to whatever mm -hmm. problems come along, Germany or whatever, Japan. Uh, we're free traders and we intend to remain free traders. Uh, is that universal in the movement? Uh, uh, I mean, is there again, any... not quite. A movement yeah. as big as ours has virtually everything yeah. in it, but uh, I think you can count on conservatism mm -hmm. if, it, if it remains true to itself, to remain true to that. Might Germany or Japan be a military threat? They might, they aren't yet, and uh, I can see many reasons why they would not. I don't raise it as a, as a bugaboo, mm -hmm. but certainly it's got to be watched. I don't agree with Francis Fukuyama that history has come to an end. Uh, we're going to go right on having more of it, as Aldous Huxley in his inimitable definition said, he didn't believe, you know, in, in cyclical things. He said history is just one damned thing after another. <laughs> are, are there any uh, lessons in the history of uh, the conservative movement for uh, those uh, former communist states that are in some sort of a transition oh, yes. to the, the market? What, what, what would those lessons be? How, how could conservatives be uh, helpful either in their well, ideology? Well, some have already been over yeah. there and have received very warm receptions. Mm -hmm. You'll notice that in contrary to all expectations, East Germany voted in effect conservatively rather than socialistically in its first free elections. A friend of mine who has been to Moscow and talked with the interregional group of deputies, which are the real opposition, a minor opposition, only about 200 votes in the big chamber, uh, says that they are way past socialism and, and thoroughly capitalistic mm -hmm. in all their impulses now. And might there be... And we, they would, we would be able to give them the benefit of what advice we can. Right. Uh, but there really isn't a, a, a map that you have uh, uh, with regard to... to getting the from here to there. there. Right. Now, that's the difficult yeah. part. There, we've got a good picture. Our mm -hmm. shining city is mm -hmm. there, and they know it's there, and they want mm -hmm. to get there. Getting there is not going to be half the fun in this particular case. Mm -hmm. It's going to be almost all agony. And uh, as I said, I, I don't see really any way to avoid it. Are you, are you bothered by the fact that, that we haven't been able to take a leading position in, in providing aid, uh, government uh, to government or government to private groups, uh, because of these, these deficits that we have no, in the debate? No, as a matter of fact, I think it's rather to the good. I, 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 with exceptions, uh, I don't think that what these people need is... Uh, is aid, financial aid from the United States. What they've got to do is reorganize their societies. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
we might actually, by giving them aid, uh, inhibit the process. Mm -hmm. So that, it, that in a way, it, it, it's, it's more our example. Yes, that's, that's, exactly. that's, that's really the, If we've the, got the, any, if there's any truth to the principles we live by, we can tell them the principles. Mm -hmm. But they've got to live by them. Are, 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 are conservatives generally, and, and yourself in particular, internationalists? And do you remain internationalists? I mean, once, once we lose the Soviet threat, mm -hmm. uh, might the uh, old isolationist uh, wing of conservatism uh, combine with the libertarian wing and, and move uh, the United States uh, uh, to a situation where it turns inward? There's a streak of isolationism in the, cons in the American people, first mm. of all, which to some degree can be detected in the conservative movement and to some degree on the left, by the way. The, uh, the uh, people up there in North and South Dakota and Minnesota, that neck of the woods, have a good deal of that in them on the liberal side. Uh, but I don't think, given the world we've got and as interrelated as it is, that this is going to be a big matter. I've been very encouraged to see the extent to which in very recent years uh, members of the conservative movement have started reaching out and networking with conservatives abroad. Mm -hmm. The liberals were way, way ahead of us on this, but we're getting there, and we now know who the leading conservatives are in France and Germany and Britain and Japan and so on, and we're in touch with them. And uh, they, they, they don't always agree with us. Their histories are different. But uh, there's much more contact going on, and I think that will keep us international. Do you think that the competitive problems that we face in the international economy will require any kind of reorientation of conservative views of, of the role of government? If conservatism is right, uh, and I think it is, then by the, direct, the correct application of conservative principles, mm -hmm. we're going to be able to do the best we can with whatever we've got in the way of problems ahead not just by dashing to big government and asking for help, certainly on either tariffs or subsidies or anything of that sort. That's exactly the wrong way to go. What uh, lesson would you like to be drawn from this, this history of the movement that we've just uh, walked through? Any, any in particular stand out about uh, the relation of ideas and politics? I can, I can do this rather well. I gather it's a sort of a conclusory question. Yes. I, uh, I can tell you how I conclude many of my talks uh, uh, because it fits very well. Yes, I, I've lived long enough, and I must say I didn't expect to live long enough, <laughs> to see a great many things happen. When Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, I thought that was the culmination. Then he was re-elected, and I thought that was. And, and now, I, a few more years later on, the, the Berlin Wall falls down, mm. and then Soviet Union crumples. So uh, we have some reason to believe that uh, the principles we have fought for and lived by have, have stood the test of time. And there's a wonderful little quatrain that I close my talks with by Coventry Patmore, the 19th century British poet, which sums the point up. And very reassuringly, he says, for want of me, the world's course will not fail. When all its work is done, the lie shall rot. The truth is great and shall prevail when none cares whether it prevail or not. Well, on that note of uh, poetry, uh, <laughs> I want to thank you very much uh, for joining us today for this uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, a very interesting historical tour, I guess one would say, of a very important movement, and, and obviously your role was very important in it. My so compliments on a, a good job of questioning. That's a free commercial. He didn't ask for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Rusher, and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation on international affairs. <laughs> <laughs>